Good evening. Uh, I'm Ben Johnson, and if I sound like a preteen boy, I apologize. We're getting over a little throat issue I had earlier this week. Um, I'm excited all of you are here tonight, and I think I think uh, speak on behalf of the the elders of hope that that we're just really thankful that this is happening tonight. That there's a lot of people here, and that um, we get the chance to talk about this issue. I'm just going to start the night by reading uh, a couple verses from Second Corinthians five. So this is 5, 16 through 19. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So I I just want to say a couple words, and then I'm going to turn it over to our speakers tonight. Um, Kind of the lineup for the night is is on on your program handout. Uh, We... When we when we talked about this issue, the reason I read this verse tonight is just that uh, through the gospel we have reconciliation to God first and foremost, but also to each other. And so the reason we're here tonight is to talk about how do we live that out? What does that look like for us to live reconciled lives um, that that speak justice and peace to the world around us that's clearly in need of it? So I'm just going to pray and give a couple of kind of FYI things about the night, and then we'll get going. So if you'll just bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for bringing each person here. And we just know that uh, you've appointed this time for us to come and, and listen and learn and discuss tonight. And so I just pray that that would happen, that your spirit would come with power on us as we speak, that you give us open hearts, open minds to receive what you would have for us tonight. We thank you so much for the gospel and for the gift of the cross and how it does make us right with you and give us the ability to be right with each other. So we ask that we'd, we'd progress in that tonight together. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, make sure I get the clicker right here. Did I do it right, Brendan? There we go. As we're going tonight, if, if uh, something one of the speakers says uh, or a thought you have that you guys uh, want to discuss later, later on in the evening, we're going to have a panel of, of people up here answering some questions. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss, you can send it into uh, that website on the screen. So we'll leave that up for a minute or so. Um, to start off tonight, uh, Pastor Steve Treichler is going to come and share with us. I'm not going to spend a time, ton of time introducing the guy because I think most of you know him. He's senior pastor here at Hope. Um, started Hope, what, 20 years ago now. And, and uh, he's married to Carol. They live in South Minneapolis. Father of three boys, all out of the house now. So just a dog. Just a dog at this point. Steve Carroll and the dog. So Steve's going to come up and kick off the night. If you guys just give him a warm welcome. Uh, I have a cup of coffee. Anybody else have a cup of coffee? There's coffee out here if you want some. And what, what, what's going to take place here is uh, just kind of think of this as if we're over a cup of coffee, even though I'm on this platform and all that jazz. Don't worry about it. Uh, and you'd ask me a question, what do you think about this? And I'm one of those guys who's going to talk for about 15 minutes. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to aim to do. I'm going to talk about 15 minutes or so on a topic that I'm pretty passionate about. You've heard me talk about it in different settings, if hope is your home. Um, so that's what's going to take place. I got a cup. Hopefully you have a cup, and we'll just sit back and enjoy this. Uh, the elders, I'm very proud of them. Uh, we've uh, thought about this long and hard, prayed about this, are very impassioned about this issue. We enter into these things carefully, so some of you might be like, oh, man, we're really late. I get that. I understand that. You want to be real careful with these things. They're sensitive. You want to get your ducks in a row and be able to... Uh, be able to uh, set things in a, in a course that will make a difference. So this is not just uh, that we're going to be doing a conference for our, our uh, church planters here in March, or yeah, March, end of March, and we'll have the, the main speaker for that. We'll also give an open talk for all the people of Hope as well. Monday, March 27th, right? Yeah. And we're calling that conference Gospel and Race Beyond Conversation. Like, 
Not that we need a ton of conversation. I'm not, we always need to be listening. But what are we going to do about this? How are we going to make this better? How are we going to make our cities, and for those of us who are in Minneapolis, St. Paul, how are we going to make our cities better because of the gospel in, in this particular area? Now, uh, I'm not 100% sure how many of you know my background. I don't know who's all here tonight. Some of you have heard this before, but I'll say it again. I grew up in a small town, Hibbing, Minnesota. And uh, 20,000 people, roughly in the time I was there, grew up in the 19th, I was born in 64, so uh, the mines at that time, it's a mining community. And what happened in the mines was that um, uh, they would constantly need new workers, and they would bring in new nationalities. So if you just see this little, uh, this, it's from this book, but you can see I'm going to read this, 43 different nationality groups populated the Iron Range. The earliest immigrants were Finnish, Swedish, Slovenian, Canadian, Norwegian, uh, Cornish, or German. After 1900, the origins of the population expanded with Italian, Croatian, Polish, Montenegrin, Serbian, Bulgarian, Rom Romanian, Slovak, Hungarian, and Greek immigrants filling mining jobs. A sizable Jewish population started. Main Street businesses, Chinese immigrants, men ran restaurants and laundries. Uh, that's, that's reality. That's how I grew up. Uh, I grew up where everyone knew your nationality. Uh, I was shocked when I came down here to Minneapolis and I would meet someone and I would hear their last name and I would say, is that Czechoslovakian? And they'd say, I don't know. And I was like, what do you mean you don't know? What's wrong with you? Uh, you should know your lineage because everyone on the Iron Range knows your lineage and it goes back. In fact, so much so as a kid, many of the homes that I went into we're second generation off the boat, and so in the home was still spoken Italian, or was still being spoken Croat, or, or different languages, and it was this beautiful thing, but they were still basically European and white, okay? But there was a tremendous amount of diversity. The food was amazing from all over the world. My friends would have different types of food, and there's a ton of different cultures, if you know anything about Europe and how that works, there's a major difference from the southern Italians and the northern. And, and so there was all kinds of diversity and beauty in that and struggle in that. So even though I came from northern Minnesota, uh, I, 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 we, I lived this. This was a daily occurrence of some of the things that I was dealing with. What I want to talk to you about tonight, and uh, again, we're all, all of us are kind of abbreviating what we're, how much time we're doing, uh, and that really does mean, does, when Trike normally says that means nothing, but tonight I'm really going to go shorter. Um, I want to talk to you about three, pre, uh, pre, three <laughs> prepositions of, no, uh, three presuppositions that I have. And when I say presupposition, some of you maybe heard that word, I want to tell you what I mean by that word. To me, a presupposition is something that you hold to be true and such a value that when something else happens, you immediately don't go to what you think is the rational explanation based on your presupposition. Let me give you an example. I really believe, and the presupposition I hold, is that God loves me. In spite of myself being a sinner and failing him, he loves me dearly. And so this fall, when within about an eight-week span, uh, Carol had cancer and, and my father died, those were rough things. But as I thought about it, I, I said to myself, well, it can't be that God doesn't love me. It just can't be that. I don't know what he's doing, but it can't be that he doesn't love me because it's a presupposition, all right? So I want to talk tonight about three, prep, three I can't say this word, three things that, that shape my understanding, three things that are values deep down, three presuppositions that are there and uh, I'm, this, this talk is going to be developed into an hour-long talk, which we're going to give to our church planters uh, in, in March. But here we go. Number one. And I know that, that maybe perhaps uh, this seems trite, but it's not, because it's the big one. All people are created equal. All people are created equal. That's a, that's a presupposition I hold, that they're all made in the image of God, and they have equal value, that they are equal, everybody. Let me get there biblically because that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing tonight. Where, where are we getting there biblically? If you go through the scriptures, and I've got to just, if you're brand new to the Bible tonight, you're just going to have to look this up, and I apologize. But 
Uh, if you go to Genesis chapters 10 and 11, you get to where different nations and languages and ultimately where races come from. And the scripture talks about the table of nations in chapter 10. It talks about this Tower of Babel where the people were confused, their languages, and they, they were spread out. And that's where it begins. And then you get to Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, God chooses one of those new people from this table of nations and this nations that take place, one person, Abraham, and says, that one person, I'm now going to take that nation. He's not a nation yet. He's a one dude. I'm going to take that one person and I'm going to have a nation unto myself. It's going to be the one that I'm going to speak into. Okay? Now that's huge. The rest of the entire Old Testament, you have that person, Abraham, his offspring, the people of Israel, becoming a nation. Right? And so you have, in essence, some racial disparity. You have Jews, and you have what's called Gentiles. Gentiles means the nations. So you have Jews and you have everybody else. Okay? So there is this tension. Like, it seems like God is choosing one nation over everybody else. And then comes Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene. He is from the tribe of, of Abraham. He is an Israelite. He comes through and something happens at the gospel. It's radical. When you get to uh, the early church, and they start to understand and spread out this gospel message. And Jesus hints at it clearly in the gospels. But it's not until the book of Acts, we get to Acts chapter 10 and 11. And there's this guy by the name of Cornelius. He's not a Jew. And this angel says to Peter, go and talk to this guy by the name of, go and talk to this guy by the name of Cornelius. And they go there. And Cornelius experiences the grace of God. It's evidenced by miracles. He does the speaking in tongues, the whole thing. And the Jewish people are blown away because this happens to a Gentile, a person who's not a Jew, and he didn't have to convert to becoming a Jew. It's radical. So much so that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote uh, the book of Romans, writes this, and he, the, the question he's dealing with in the book of Romans is, there's Jewish people and there's non-Jewish people. What about both parties? And he says to this, he says, when he gets to chapter 3, uh, verses 19 and on, he says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be accountable to God. Who is that? Jew and Gentile, right? Therefore, no one who, Jew and Gentile, will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. If you're an Israelite, you just had a front row seat. <laughs> That's your benefit, but you're a sinner. And if you're a Gentile, you're further away, but you guess what? You, you had conscience and ordinance of the law. He talks about you had it on your heart about this, and you're a sinner too. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, everyone who believes. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all, Jew and Gentile, that's what it means, have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, and all Jew and Gentile can come to faith, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, I know when you read that, and I read that, uh, you know, we kind of get this thing, that's, okay, that's nice. You gotta understand, most of the people in this room are Gentile. If there's a racial issue in, te in the scripture, it's Jew and the rest of us, and we're outside. And the scripture says, no, all now, it's level ground before the cross. When you get to the uh, uh, book of Ephesians, Paul says that the actual mystery of the gospel is not the fact that God came down and, and, and the, in, in Jesus Christ and paid the penalty for our sin. The mystery of the gospel is this. I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made moan. Ah, made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, and it has now been made, has been now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Members together of one body and chairs together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So if you read the rest of the New Testament, you see there's this tension all over the place. Everywhere they start churches, that the Jewish people think that they're better 
than the Gentile people. That there, there's racism and they just say, no, no, they're dogs. We're, we're God special and there's not. And Paul's trying to say, you're right that the Gentiles are dogs, but you guys are all dogs too when it comes to do we owe, God doesn't owe us anything. And it's total grace and love that he has for every bearer of his image, every one. Now, this is huge. This changes everything. Star Tribune writes that there was an uptick. This is from uh, 2016, about a year ago, that there was an uptick in graduation rates. The, uh, in, they did the previous year at that time. They said that, uh, uh, was it an uptick? Let's see. Many rates last year, but they st saw more students of color graduating. So there was an uptick in the students of color graduating. So they said that 81.9% 81 of high school seniors uh, graduate in four years compared with 81.2 if you're not of color. And then for black seniors, 62% completed high school last year compared to 60.4% in 2014. Now, a couple things you can do with that. You can be encouraged to say the numbers are up. That's a good thing, right? The second thing you look at here and go, wait a minute now. It's still 62% to roughly 82%. If you hold the presupposition I just said, you look at that and say, well, there's a 20-point gap, right? But I, I'm saying all people are created equal. So it's not that African-American kids lack intelligence. Can't be that. Can't be that. Well, what is it then? There's something. But it can't be that they lack intelligence. Because you start that. It's your starting point. If you look at the state, of, the city of Minneapolis has uh, this technology where every time a gun is fired, it goes bing, it can tell. Uh, I can't remember the name of the technology. Anybody know? What's that called? Shot spotter. That's what it's called. And so here's a map. It's just one week, and I just picked a week. I didn't, there was nothing special about this particular week. This is the week of July 5th through July 11th, 2016. And just at a, you can see it from a glance. You can see that North Minneapolis has more shots fired than anywhere else in the city, right? If you look at that, you go, huh. Now, if you look at that map and say, well, well, that's where more African-American people live. If you hold what I just held, which is the presupposition that all people are created equal, you will not go to the conclusion and say, well, African-American people are more prone to criminal activity. You can't go there. You say, I, I don't know what it is, but it can't be that. It can't possibly be that. Now, what is it? It's got to be issues of poverty and family breakdown and other things, drug use and whatever. But it can't be that they're more prone to anything. And you just hold that as a hardcore presupposition. It cannot be that. That's the number one rule. If you're not there, I really want to challenge you. I really want to challenge you. Biblically speaking, you have no possible foot to stand on. All people are equal. So what is it? Why are these things happening? We've got to ask that question. That's a great question. But it can't possibly be that they're not as smart or that they're more prone to criminal activity. That is, by the way, is the definition of racism. It's not true. Proposition. Oh, now I want to state it backwards. If I state my presupposition the other way, racism exists because biblical anthropology doesn't. If you think of people the way the Bible teaches you to think of people, you will not be a racist. You will not have racist tendencies because you will say, I know that all people are created equal. Now, there's, some other, else, there's other things going on here. What are those things? But not because of someone's race, color of skin, those things. Nope, no way, not a chance. Number two, proposition number Two, presupposition, excuse me. Looking down on anyone because of their race is wrong and always sinful. If you are looking down at someone and seeing them differently because of their race, you have a gospel problem. You have a gospel problem. Listen to this, Galatians chapter 2. Peter, one of the, the big dog of all the apostles, slipped into this. And Paul calls him out 
publicly about it. He says, when Cephas, that's another name for Peter, when they came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Just make sure he says exactly how it took place. Because he stood condemned. He was wrong. How was he wrong? For before certain men came from James, these people came into this area and they influenced them, he used to eat with the Gentiles. He hung out with them. He went into their homes and he, they were all tight. But then all of a sudden when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Woo! Ah, it's no big deal. He just doesn't want to eat, you know, he doesn't want to eat another pork sandwich or something, right? Or whatever the Gentiles were eating. And no, Paul says, that is fundamentally wrong, Peter. You are missing the gospel if you're not relating with folks because you're looking down on them. I want to challenge you with that in just about every category, including race. I want to challenge you. You walk by a homeless person, do you instantly think, huh, just get a job. What's wrong with you? Now, maybe they do need to get a job. That's, but do, do, you, do you stop and say, somehow I'm better than that? Mm. I had a moment. It was incredible. I was in Brazil, and we were in a slum. And um, when you're in the slums in Brazil, and you're and without any kind of outside help, there's two pathways for you. If you're a girl, prostitution. If you're a boy, drug trafficking. That's your, that's your lanes. And there are government agencies, a few. Brazil's really corrupt. There are a bunch of outside things coming in that uh, or want to help them excel out of this, and they are. But we met some folks, and, and you met, the, uh, met a woman, and, and she had seven children, all from different fathers, which probably meant prostitution. And it was a brand new little baby sitting there, and I went in, they had one bedroom, seven kids, and a mom, one bedroom. And she had this hammock uh, strung up, and the baby was in there. And I looked at the baby, and I, uh, the older I get, the more uh, Pentecostal I get. I, I just felt this, the whole Lord speaking to me like, there is no reason on the planet that that couldn't be you. That, that I could have not been born right there. That's true. There's nothing better about me because I was born in Minnesota or white or black or Indian or, or, or whatever, Asian. Nothing better. So stated the other way is racism flourishes... Because of legalism. Now, legalism, by that, what I mean is, somehow I view myself as better than you. I am, I'm a little better than you. I have better activities. I have better uh, pedigree. I have better behavior. I, whatever. I'm better than you. And that causes racism to flourish. Three, third and last presupposition. The solution is the gospel. Period. Period, period, I guess. <laughs> Word, attitude, and behavior. Word, attitude, and behavior. Listen to this. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. I'm convinced that the gospel says that Jesus Christ did not just die for people from northern Minnesota. I'm convinced that he died for all kinds of people. Every single kind of person Every image bearer of God that has fallen, he died for so that they could come to him. And he died for all that we should no longer live for ourselves, themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And then Paul even says this, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The gospel then says, I need to view myself properly, not less, but certainly not more than anyone else. Everyone's created equal. I, in fact, need to not look down on people. And therefore, in word, in an attitude, and in deed, uh, I need to be a person who is part of the solution. What would that look like? What would that look like as I'm a person who says, I refuse. I am going to hold that as a presupposition. I am going to hold down that all people are created equal. That whenever I hear something about uh, African American people doing certain things, I'm not going to say, well, it's not because of their, that's negative, say perhaps. Um, it's not because of their race. No, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's not that. It can't be that. 
number one. Number two, I will not look down on people. I will not look down on people that, because of racism in our country, has led to a whole bunch of things, including crime, drug addiction, gangs, things that are very bad. I'm, they're not good, but I refuse to look down upon them. I remember the first time in my life, I was, uh, geez, I don't know how old I was, uh, 35, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I remember being around, I was in Chicago, a friend of mine, and he had a ministry to men who were coming out of prison, and there was this large African-American gentleman who had come to Christ, but he killed multiple people. And I remember shaking his hand, and I remember feeling like, I am no different than you. I have not killed anybody, but I'm, you're my brother in Christ. And it was amazing. That moment was just like, whoa, it's a holy moment, man. It's a beautiful moment. And what would it mean then for me and my behavior? What would it mean in my behavior for me to actually love? And love means that I don't just love the people that I'm naturally attracted to. That's just preference. Love means I actually love people who maybe I have to lay down some preference to get to know and get to love. So let me state this the, the other way. Racism is defeated through gospel-powered love in head, heart, and hands. That's how we're going to change a city, Hope Community, and anybody's here. We're going to change it, but it's going to happen. Head, heart, hands. Let's pray together. God, I really look forward to hearing my brothers speak tonight about their experiences and, and what you've done in their lives. God, would you fill us so with the gospel that we are people who deeply want to follow you and deeply want to love people who you've made. Make us be part of the solution and not more of the problem. May you transform our city and our world, God, because of the, your kingdom moving in. Do that even tonight in this room, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.